Mine. And this is my home leap cottage. When I'm not presenting or writing about gardening, this is where I spend most of my time and where I've been honing my horticultural skills for 40 years. Whether you've got a spacious plot, a tiny patio, or a few window boxes, there's nothing more exciting and satisfying than creating your own garden. From basic to more advanced techniques, I believe anyone can learn how to do it. Whether you're a complete novice or an experienced gardener, I want to help you develop the skills to make your garden grow. I'm ready. Are you? Hello, and welcome to my garden at Glebe Cottage in North Devon on this most glorious summer's day. Everything's changed so much over the last couple of months. The whole garden is exuberant. It's exploded into growth. That spring wardrobe has been abandoned. Now all the plants have got out their summer frocks and they're looking absolutely gorgeous. Just thrilled with the sunshine. We've had loads of rain too, so everything's growing apace. Let me show you around. I want to reacquaint you with the garden. The garden is divided into different areas or rooms, and all of them have changed dramatically since you were last here. This is the brick garden. It's called that because all the paths here are made of bricks, but at the moment you can't see them. In fact, you can hardly see any paths anywhere. And the boundaries of the garden, whether it's hedges, fences, walls, have all started to disappear under this absolute burgeoning of plants. These are the grasses which are cut back really, really hard. Way back in the spring, I took my sharpest shears and cut this beautiful grass, this Hakanakloa, down to the ground in the confident knowledge that it would return. And it certainly has. It's done so with a vengeance. Actually, it's done so beautifully. And now it's just draping itself over the path. And <laughs> this euphorbia was knee-high, full of beautiful flowers. And it, now it's taller than me. And through the centre of the euphorbia, this iris has appeared with these gorgeous blue flowers. But I suppose the plant that's really in complete control now is geranium pretense, the meadow crane's bill. It's here, there and everywhere, self-seeded and just bringing the whole of the brick garden to life. But some gardeners might take them out and might think they're in the wrong place. But... If they've put themselves there, they're in the right place and I really believe in letting plants do their thing, letting them be themselves. Such a boolean growth really benefits from being shaped and defined by hedges and other boundaries. To delineate this part of the garden from the next, we've used this box hedge. It's not your usual tidy, you know, manicured box hedge. It's a great big swirling thing. It's cloud pruned, which means that it sort of replicates those beautiful big cumulus clouds that are up in the sky. As well as being the exit from the brick garden, this is also the entrance to a different part of the garden, to Alice's garden. Down here, there's a completely different atmosphere. It's almost like going into a different world. In the brick garden, we rely very, very heavily on lots of grasses. But here, for a start, the colour's totally different. Everything is pink and crimson and white, because this is Alice's garden. Alice is my youngest daughter, and those are the kind of colours that she loves. But it's made separate. You feel as though you're in a, a, a different kind of place because of what surrounds it. On 
on one side of the garden, I've created a continuous hedge that blends perfectly with the rural landscape beyond. We've got a huge native hedge that runs right the way down from top to bottom of the garden. And it's just such a wonderful opportunity to bring 10 or 12 different species of trees and shrubs into the garden. And the more you've got, the more wildlife you attract, the more diverse your hedges, the better it is. We've got birds nesting in here, loads of insects, because of course there are lots of flowers within it too. And I mean, I'm lucky I've got this great expanse of hedge, but it's an idea that anybody could adopt in a small garden. You just want to separate a little piece of it off. Why not just plant a few native trees? And eventually it'll grow and become a, a, a total haven. I think Fifi's really thrilled that I've left this fern here because it's just the perfect place for an afternoon snooze in the shade. <laughs> but hot dogs are not the only things that enjoy the conditions in this part of the garden. Hedges present an exciting opportunity to plant all sorts of things that will thrive in these kind of conditions. Hedges are wonderful on their own, but if they've got climbers as well inside them, dog roses, honeysuckle, all those sort of lovely wild climbers, then they're all the richer. They, they can offer homes and food, nectar to all sorts of other creatures too. There's something else I want to add here to lure more creatures in. Well, this is the plant I've chosen to go in here. It's absolutely perfect, really, because it's a native hedge and I want a native climber, and this is a honeysuckle. Not only does it make lovely twining growth, which will grow right up through here, but it's endowed with these really beautiful flowers. Only got a couple at the moment, but right now it's going in the hedge. I'm digging a hole at the foot of the hedge. I'm really happy that the size of this hole is adequate. It's much bigger than this root ball is going to be because I don't want it cramped up in there. I want it to feel like it can spread its roots out every which way. So now comes the very simple step of removing it from its pot. Look at that. Decent roots, really smashing. And I'm just going to lower it into this hole and they're going to climb up eventually, right into here. I'll be able to start it off on its journey and then I'm sure it'll take care of itself. And put back this compost. Right the way around. And they don't even have to kneel down. I can just gently Heal this in to that space. I can feel that the soil here is just perfect. It should settle down within a couple of weeks. Now it needs a thorough drink and I'll keep on watering it until it's established. And next, how to make lots more honeysuckle for free. This lovely hedgerow climber is one I wouldn't be without. I grew it myself from a cutting. This is the plant that I actually took the cutting from to grow that one initially. So there are several places here which will yield absolutely brilliant cutting material. Now most of these, can you see, have got little buds in them. And wherever possible, you should avoid taking cuttings from any shoot which is going to produce a flower because it'll keep on trying to do that. But here, look at this. One, two, three, four, five really good pieces. So that's the ideal sort of length. Now I need to prepare the cuttings. 
Now, ideally, you should do this first thing in the morning because the material's full of sap at that stage. But I think these would be absolutely fine. So all I'm going to do with this nice big chunk here is just gently pull that down. It's got a little heel then at the end of that. I'm just going to take all these bottom leaves and then I'm going to cut right above that leaf node. A leaf node is just the place where the leaves join the stem, that's all it means. And I'm going to go right in there and cut it off with a, a really sharp knife. So I'm just going to neaten that heel up. That's much better. You don't want to leave anything behind that little tail because it could make it rot. So I'll get another cutting out of here. So again, right under a leaf node, bottom leaves off. You want a, a decent length because that's all going to be under the soil. So you don't want any leaves sticking in there. I want to nip out the top. Just stop it heading for the sky because I want it to make a nice bushy plant. And then comes the exciting bit. So I've got these terracotta pots because cuttings always take much more readily when they're in a terracotta pot than they're doing plastic ones. They're filled almost to the brim with very gritty compost. No peat, of course. And I'm just going to dibble these down so that the soil comes to just below those bottom leaves. Maybe four to each pot, because you want to give them enough room so the roots can spread out when they do root. It'll take a few weeks, maybe as long as oh, six weeks or so. But because this is nice, young, fresh wood, they should root fairly quickly. But because it's young and fresh, it means that they're going to lose water really rapidly. So just spray them every time you walk past <laughs> with one of those sprays that you use for doing the ironing. So there they are, all sitting happily in there. We've got enough room to expand. And all I'll do now is put a load of grit on the top. It's lovely to have honeysuckle, preferably somewhere where you can come out in the evening and just enjoy that glorious fragrance. Just remains to water these. Do it over here, I think. I love to see honeysuckle wending its way through hedgerows, but at this time of year, it's often outshone by a more spectacular sight. How about that? Isn't it superb? Towering up out of the hedge, way above me, way above the top of the hedge too. It's a foxglove, and of course, it's instantly recognisable. Nobody planted them, they put themselves there but always with that same message that summer's here. This splendid creature is Digitalis purpurea. It's our own native foxglove, and you always find it growing in just this sort of situation, along hedgerows and banks. Now, in our gardens, we've all got places which are akin to some sort of wild place. You've almost certainly got a fence, a wall, a, a boundary of some sort. And when we look at similar wild habitats, it gives us clues immediately to the kind of plants that thrive there. And nothing could be more at home on a boundary or a hedgerow than a foxglove. In my garden, there's a wonderful example of one that's made itself completely at home. Uninvited, but certainly not unwelcome. Can I have a look at this? Isn't this wonderful? <laughs> it's just sown itself right there in the side of this trough that's full of potatoes and parsley. But it couldn't care less. It's the ideal place as far as it's concerned. And what is it? It's a white version of our native foxglove. So it's Digitalis purpurea alba. I've seen these 
growing in the wild all over the place. The ordinary purple version has loads and loads of spots. They're kind of pollen guides really to bring the bees in. But I'll tell you what, all the bees have been visiting this and look, it's already starting to set seed. I'm hoping to save lots of a seed from here. I want to leave the plant and let them all ripen. But meanwhile, I've got to think about sowing next year's crop of foxglove seeds. Oh, I love this moment when you're getting your seed tray ready and you're going to sow these beautiful tiny little seeds. Now, if you want your foxgloves to be just where you want them to be, if you want to be able to plant them very deliberately around your garden, they're biennials, so this is the right kind of time to sow them. If I sow this seed now, it'll develop into small seedlings. In about six weeks' time, I can prick them out individually, pot them on, and I'll end up by the autumn with fine big plants to put out. They'll overwinter, and then next year we'll see those towering spikes rising up all over the garden. So a tiny pinch of seed. I can hardly pinch it, it's so fine. And just a couple of inches above the surface of the compost. It's almost a, a kind of act of faith, this. I can just feel the seed between my fingers just falling onto the surface of this. I've probably got enough there to sow a couple of trays. It's so tempting to say, oh, they're only tiny seeds, I'll just sow the lot. But you really must try and sow them very sparsely because otherwise, once they germinate, this whole seed tray will be thick with seedlings and you won't be able to separate them. They won't get a chance to grow on properly. And um, when you've done that, the usual sprinkle with grit. Whilst this will take two years before these flower, I've put together a selection of foxgloves and some of their relatives to show you how many gorgeous choices they offer us. Look at those, aren't they glorious? What's that colour remind you of? It's sort of, if you mix raspberries with cream or something like that, but don't eat them because all digitalis, all foxgloves are poisonous, but you can't help admiring that colour. Now, there are all sorts of different foxgloves. I mean, the ones that we're most familiar with are our Digitalis purpurea, the purple foxglove, and occasionally it's lovely white version too. And they are straight species plants there, just as nature made them. And what's more, they're indigenous. In other words, they come from here. But foxgloves lend themselves to hybridisation, so there are all sorts of new foxgloves constantly being introduced. Here's one. This is from the Camelot series, and this has got these big, broad bells that actually face outwards. I mean, it's a very showy plant. But some foxgloves are, are not quite so ostentatious. Look at this one. It's called Digitalis parviflora, and that means small-flowered and it's actually evergreen, but they're very tolerant and really straightforward plants. Foxgloves belong to a wider plant family. This includes penstemons and verbascums. They all share physical characteristics with one another. If you look at this pink penstemon, this is Hiccup Pink, and you compare it to Digitalis mertonensis, you can immediately see the family resemblance that they're related. Now, the family that all these plants, including these beautiful verbascums, belong to, used to be called Scrofulariaceae, and just when I'd learnt how to say it, they went and changed it. I love verbascums. Very, very closely related to foxgloves, but the flowers are slightly different, have a, a different form. But this is one of my favourites of all time. It's a verbascum called Cotswold King, and it's got one real special advantage, it's actually scented. It's 
lovely. But all these plants really are great plants to grow in a sort of hedgerow situation, in a border alongside a boundary fence. Absolutely wonderful. And they have another thing in common. Slugs don't like them. You won't see slugs ever biting into any of these leaves at all. So that's another brilliant reason to grow them, as if you needed one. And I never need an excuse to plant plenty of these. They're Antorhinums, another member of the same family, and perhaps better known as snapdragons. I planted these as plugs last year, and this was our kind of overspill cut flower bed. And there are two different varieties in here. There are proper traditional snapdragons, the ones that when you're a kid you just squeeze at the back and the flowers open up. And then these with these flat sort of faces, which are modern hybrids and absolutely brilliant cut flowers. You can see immediately the similarities. They're almost kind of halfway between a penstemon and a foxglove, and they do belong to exactly the same family. Antorhinums were always called snapdragons in my granddad's garden. He used to grow loads of them. But this was a thing that we used to love to do, which gives them their true name. I hope this works. Oh, there. <laughs> Can you see that? The whole flower opens up. And of course, that's exactly what happens when a bee comes in. Well, I'm hoping that there are going to be a few of these flowers left when my grandchildren come, because I'd love to show them how to do that. Later on, I'm going to include some of these beautiful hedgerow plants in an exciting new project. But next, how our intensive vegetable experiment is coming along. When we very first came here, growing vegetables was a real priority. We wanted to grow our own and feed ourselves. And ever since that, and that's 43 years ago, it's been one of the top things on my list. Now, most of our veg grow close to the house in the main vegetable garden. But this spring, I started a brand new venture, just trying to see how many veg I could cram in to one of these concrete troughs. It's going all right, too. In the spring, I started by putting in some young plants. Swiss chard was one of them. And also by sowing seed directly, including carrots. Things are coming on by leaps and bounds. This is a, a little row of garlic, and I put it on the end as a kind of companion plant to try and fend off the carrot fly that sometimes attacks carrots, of course. And I'm just wondering whether any of these are actually ready for pulling. Wish me luck. Ooh! Not exactly a prized specimen, but it's not bad at all. I wanted to try these carrots in here because in the garden they always get carrot fly. And the thing about the carrot fly is that <laughs> purportedly it can only actually fly about 18 inches high, so well out of the way when they're growing in this trough. And it seems to have worked. So around the back of this chard is a little row of peas and they're really beginning to grow voluminously now and they're actually shading out this beetroot. So I want to put some twiggy pea sticks, some bits of hazel that I've saved from the winter and um, just give them a bit of support so they grow in a, a more orderly fashion and they don't obscure other things. I'll go and get some pea sticks. These pea sticks are from some of the branches I cut from a hazel that nearly got flattened by the ferocious winds earlier on. So the whole idea of this is just to lift them. You've got to do it on both sides of the row though, or it topples over. These are usually called twiggy pea sticks, but I always want to call them piggy twee sticks. Much funnier that way. Can you see the peas have 
all got tendrils, so they're looking for something to climb up, so that gives them su some support. If you don't give them any kind of support at all, they'll just sprawl all over the place, and the flowers won't be able to flower properly, and therefore pea pods won't be produced. I might have to put a few extra of these in later, but that should be enough to be going on with. With the garlic working well as a natural repellent, I'm going to try something else at the other end of the trough. I want to put in something which is not just ornamental, very, very beautiful and brings a bit of colour into the bed, but it's also going to do a job as a companion plant. This is a tagetes, a marigold called burning embers that we actually grew from seed. They're absolutely superb companion plants. Look at that gorgeous velvety flower, isn't that just beautiful? It's lovely. So I'm just going to plonk these in, they'll get away to a brilliant start. Tearing these roots down a little bit, then they'll fly into this soil. And before you know where you are, these plants will have bushed out and any carrot fly, aphis, whatever, will be put off. Because these have, you can't smell them, but they have the most pungent smell. I really, really like the smell of them. Once I've watered them in, I can leave them to be good companions whilst looking absolutely gorgeous. I've got a second veg trough alongside this one in which I've recently cleared a big space. There's plenty of stuff waiting in the greenhouse to fill it back up again. And at the front of the queue are these squashes. Having a drink, Fifi? Yeah? That's better. I've got three here and I'll probably get another couple in this big trough. And this is a squash called Uchiki Kuri. And there's so many different ways of cooking them. I just love them straightforwardly baked because then you can really taste the flavour. But also you can store them right the way through the winter. I want to space them out a bit. When I filled these troughs in the first place, we put loads and loads of our own compost in here. All sorts of really good stuff. You can tell there's real loads of goodness in here and they're going to enjoy living here. So, here we go. Oh! There, into the hole. And I want to plant them so they're just level with the, the soil around them don't want to bury them. Firm them in nicely and they'll soon spread the roots out. Now I think it's a good idea when you're growing any sort of squashes or um, pumpkins, courgettes, any of the cocoa bits that you're growing outside. That's that whole family, the name for the family because they're all related closely. It's a good idea to mound the soil up a little bit around there, but then to make a kind of trench just out from there, so that when you water, some of the water is retained in there and it doesn't just all run away into the rest of the soil. That's all you need to do, and then just wait. All that remains is to give everything a thorough watering. Closer to the house are the main, more traditional veg growing areas. Well, these two great big beds here, both raised from the ground on sleepers, so there's a real good depth of soil there and my main areas for growing vegetables and I grow all sorts of stuff here put sweet peas and beans in the back and then loads of peas, beetroot, the lot and I also grow, especially in this one, potatoes but this year I haven't <laughs> and yet 
Look who's sprung up here. Absolutely masses of spuds. So <laughs> you call these potatoes volunteers. Now that's not a variety like King Edward or Maris Piper. It just means they turned up without anybody asking them. <laughs> I need this space. So I'm going to lift these spuds, hope that there'll actually be a crop on the roots of them. Though the soil is quite dry, I've still put a plank down here because that sort of spreads my weight and doesn't compact the soil. If you compact the soil, if you just walk about nonchalantly all over the place, for a start you get rid of all the oxygen in the soil and roots need oxygen, but also all those little microorganisms who actually make your soil fertile, because it's a living thing, your soil, they all get squashed. Oh! Hurrah! <laughs> we have liftoff. Our first two spuds, volunteers. Hooray! Right, so just a bit of work to get the rest of this lot out and then we can start planting the next thing. And for that, I'm going to follow an age-old practice. It works best on a bigger scale, but you can adapt it if space is limited. That's quite a weight. I've got three plants here, three different plants, but they're all going to be grown interdependently. It's from the Americas, and it was a practice where these three plants were grown, a pumpkin, or it could be a squash in this case. I'm actually going to try it with a courgette, which is for covering the ground and keeping the moisture in and keeping the weeds down. But then the central part is a, a corn, a maize, which grows up. I'm going to plant a bean beside it and that eventually will use, because it's a climbing bean, will use the maize to actually climb up and they'll all three grow together brilliantly and it gives you a bountiful crop makes a very good use of space too and you really feel that these plants are happy growing together so I'll get plenty first to go in is the courgette and I want to be very careful because this is all top heavy at the moment until I've sunk it down into this soil and I can lift up its leaves move this compost over that's it you wait and see really rapidly now they'll make such growth and as for sweet corn which is next on the agenda I mean the, the stuff you buy in the supermarket which has probably travelled for miles and miles sometimes over the ocean and when you compare it to the taste of the stuff you've grown yourself, the really literally is no comparison at all. Last but not least, our twining climber. I've never grown this bean before, it's Blau Hilled, but I really fancy the sound of it. But the growth on this is it's rampant, but it's, it's sort of daintier really. So we'll let that keep going up there and hope that this maize, this corn, catches up fairly rapidly. Oh, dusty knees. Well, if you only had that amount of space, you could do this just the same. You'd have to make sure that your sweet corn got pollinated, but it'd be a cinch and it's a lovely thing to do. I think it's going to work. leave this part of the garden without indulging myself in a special treat. The scent of these flowers is so evocative of the summer. I suppose the very moment you see the first sweet pea open you know that summer has arrived and it's the greatest joy to actually pick the first bunch. Of course the more you cut them the more they'll produce so you, you can't cut them too often, too frequently. With a bit of luck, 
and some care and attention, we should be picking bunches of these all summer long. Leap Cottage, we've got a number of areas, partly defined by their different conditions and partly by their boundaries and features like paths and raised beds. This is the very bottom of the garden. I call it the shed garden for the simple reason that there's a great big shed in it. I used to run a nursery, did so for about 30 years, and these sleepers that I've constructed these beds here with were part of the nursery. So best way to recycle them was to bring them down here and do this whole new thing with lots of raised beds. But they're pretty packed <laughs> as they are. And you know me, I want an excuse to grow more plants. So I've got a brand new project that I'm just about to start. So right in the corner, outside the shed, look what I've built. <laughs> I've built this brand new raised bed. It's built with sleepers and it's filled with topsoil, a lot of recycled compost too, and it's just ready to be planted. Like the concrete veg troughs, this is designed to work either in a very small garden or as one part of a larger one. It's going to be home to a gorgeous display of those for Bascom's foxgloves and penstemons. Fifi's drooling at the idea. Now, whenever you're going to plant a new bed, a virgin bed like this that's completely untouched, it's such a temptation when you've got all these exciting things just to bung them in here, there and everywhere. But don't forget, these plants are going to stay here for ages and ages. So you want them in the right place for a start. I always like to set everything out before I start planting. This design is going to be about height and making the most of this range of statuesque plants. There are all sorts of rules and regulations when it comes to planting, but forget them. <laughs> Do your own thing, definitely. But what I like to do if I've got tall plants like this, instead of doing that regimented tallest at the back, gradually being graded down to the shortest at the front, is to, not just to mix it up, but to deliberately use these tall plants, this vertical accent, so it runs from the back of the bed right the way through to the front. So I'm going to use a bascom like that, I'm going to use this Digitalis Mertonensis like that too. The whole idea then is perhaps to put some shorter plants in between. So as you walk across, you'll see things happening from the back right through to the front. So I'll arrange a few things first before I start planting. So I've got four, I think, of this Digitalis Mertonensis. So if I just have them, yeah. So you get a little bit of a curvy line maybe there and then I'm going to put in between them something low. In all these beds I've used an astrantia called Roma, pretty pink flowers and it runs all the way through and I think it would be lovely to link this bed with the bigger garden and you can see the top of its flowers is sort of here-ish, just about bee height <laughs> and the foliage is lower than that so it's a perfect plant for making this kind of a recess right through here. Where's that other one? So I'm going to put that right in this corner. And this is a plant that's very, very tolerant. Good hedgerow plant. Will stand being out in the sun. One of the tallest plants is heading for the front corner here. This is really cheeky. It might seem a bit strange putting this right on the corner, but it's a lovely focal point. You see it immediately and then you want to see what's behind it you want to see round it and also it'll pick up on the three in the background as well it's really exciting it's it's not a stage set because it grows and changes all the time but there is a theatrical element to it as well that's what makes it such good fun 
I've also added some spectacular tall verbascans, which continue the spire-like theme. But next, I'm adding something that will prolong the display of colour well into the autumn. Well, we used to call this Aster divaricatus. Its name now is Eurybia divaricata, but it's still the same plant. And it's an absolute glory, especially towards the end of the summer into autumn, when all these stems, having grown up, will lean over with lots of space between them. It has the most beautiful deportment and be smothered in tiny little white flowers with dark centres. And I bet we'll see when we plant them that they've got belting roots. Yeah, look at that. Oh, all ready to go. So this bed faces south here. So this end is going to receive the, the brightest sun. But penstemons love sunshine. And this is a young plant, it's Hidcote Pink. Very pretty little plant, but it will eventually make a nice dense clump of really beautiful shiny leaves, evergreen leaves too. And it will flower and flower and flower, these lovely tubular flowers. So I'm going to put that one there. Matches up pretty well, doesn't it? But it's nice when the colours of these plants sort of tally and really go together brilliantly. Now my waves of plants are complete, I can get on with putting everything in. Finally, job done. I can stand back and enjoy my new display. I suppose on a, a rainy day, this is how I'd see this. And if you had a bed like this just in front of your kitchen windowsill, then this would be a view. And it's, it's smashing with the rest of the garden too. I think it's quite successful, but I mean, time will tell, but for now, I think it's really lovely. It's so good to have you back in the garden again for the summer. I hope you've enjoyed it. I mean, a really exciting project to start with and there's loads more to do. Next time, what happens when you've got too much of a good thing? If this tree kept all its fruit, these branches would bend down. There's a possibility that they might snap too. And the scent of summer is on the air as I tend to our most beloved bloom. Roses really are the epitome of summer. <laughs>